All right, Grace, here's the latest that we're looking at. We just finished Labor Day weekend, and so we're kind of officially rolling into the fall, right? School's starting back up and different things are happening. It feels like we're moving a little bit more toward normalcy, uh, but at the same time, some things are still a little bit different, and it's no different here at Grace. And so we appreciate your patience. We appreciate your flexibility. We appreciate your, your approach and willingness to understand. Uh, if God is teaching us anything in this season, I think it's that reminder from James 4 of us needing to practice humility. It's fine for us to say, hey, today or tomorrow, we're going to do this and that. We're going to make our plans. We're going we're gonna to seek to be good stewards with what God's given us. But at the same time, knowing our lives are a vapor, we're, we're not really in control. And so we don't really get to determine ultimately what's going to happen. So this entire video is encased in the words, Lord willing. Like this is what we're thinking toward, we're planning toward, but we need to acknowledge we're not really in control. And so we're gonna be flexible in that. And I think as a church, we're learning that well and applying that well. So I wanna keep walking through with that. But I wanna let you know a couple different things. Not only is the Lord teaching us, and hopefully he is even in the midst of the struggles and difficulties, we just heard that well said from Psalm 90 this Sunday of uh, the Lord still teaching us, even in the affliction, even in the difficulties, he's still good and he's still drawing his children closer to him. And so we um, don't wanna just survive this season for however long it is, we want to actually flourish. We want to grow. And it doesn't mean it's all joy and giggles, but it does mean that we can see the sovereign hand of God drawing us closer to his son and making us look more like him, even in the midst of that. And so even as we think through those things, it's causing us as, as an elder team and as a church to look and say, okay, uh, let's keep thinking through why we do what we do and, and the ways that we do it and seek to honor the Lord in that. So first of all, I want to encourage you a couple of things. In the midst of this long season we've been in, the Lord has still been working in some things. There's some uh, new families that have been coming around. There's a Welcome to Grace class uh, that just finished up, and I think you're going to be seeing several of those people coming into membership in the next few uh, weeks or months. Uh, there's a couple baptisms that are taking place, and we're open to more of those. I know we've had a couple conversations with people that are interested in responding that way. During the midst of COVID, uh, we graduated uh, about 12 people from Porterbrook. That's a three-year pretty intense commitment of uh, study and reading and applying scripture to their lives, and it's part of what we use to even prepare for church planning. And so as you've heard Marco and Lisa share, even in the midst of everything their family has been facing, that the, they really believe the Lord is continuing to, to move forward the idea of a church plant in Richmond, Indiana. Part of that is also uh, not just Marco, but three other guys kind of stepping into elder leadership. And you've been seeing them up in front of you, not as elders yet, but kind of as elder candidates. And in the next couple weeks and months, you're going to see them presented in front of you for the idea of assessing them as elders, running them through the qualifications and letting us as a church know. So uh, some good things are definitely happening. The Lord's continued. It, he will build his church, right? We don't. He's going to build his church, and he's doing that globally, uh, but we've also gotten to see examples of it, uh, even in good things that are happening at Greenville Grace, even through kind of an unusual season. Um, now, we are, with moving into the fall, September 20th, we are looking to kind of roll into what might be our new normal for a while. A um, couple things to, to notice about that, that we're, we're going to still be adapting and changing, but but we want to claim some of those things as a, as a good opportunity for us to grow as well. It still doesn't feel right for us to do our greet your neighbor during the service. It just doesn't seem to be a wise practice yet. Um, reminder to that, that's not just a, hey, what's going on type of thing, but it really is supposed to model part of our gospel liturgy. Because Christ has reconciled us to God, we then can experience reconciliation to one another. So because of what Jesus did, we can truly love God and love our neighbor. And so the greeting time is supposed to be kind of a, a literal expression of that as we go around and, and greet one another. Here's the thing. While we're not doing that yet, and that feels like a sacrifice from gospel liturgy, there's another element of it where, again, we can hopefully claim and grow and learn from. While I love our greeting time, and it's a great display of that, I know it can kind of be awkward for visitors showing up. Uh, they don't know people. They feel really intimidated to step out into the aisle and start shaking hands or something. And, and it, it, though it's never our intention, it can sometimes feel like a little bit of an alienating moment. 
And so by not doing the greeting time, we're actually affording ourselves the ability, man, the weather's been awesome. Even since COVID, I don't think we've had like a massive rain on a Sunday or anything like that. People can go outside, can greet one another out there, can talk. And man, if you would take advantage, this is the perfect season to approach somebody that you don't know and say, wow, you know, it's been weird. We have different services. We're wearing masks half the time. You can't recognize each other. Like introduce yourself, get to know somebody, see if there's ways to help plug them in, get them into your life group or, or find out if there's anything they need to be able to, to connect or have answers about the church. So while we can't do the formal greeting time in the service, I think this could actually encourage us to seek to be a little bit more hospitable and to reach out a little bit better. So let's kind of try and take advantage of that. Uh, we usually were taking the offering in our service, right, as an expression of that gospel rhythm as well. Uh, we're not giving to God so that he will forgive us. We we would rehearse the songs that lay our minds on the gospel. We'd look at scripture that reminds us of the gospel. And then we would receive the offering saying this is our response to what God has done for us. Because he has given to us, we then can trust him and release everything to him. We're not going to be able to do that, and the services still just doesn't seem wise. And in some ways, that feels like we're losing a little bit of that joyful element, that, oh, my response to the work of Christ is with joy, not compulsion, to be able to give. Uh, hopefully, still continue to do the joyful part. We talk about sacrificial, joyful. The third element, though, is talk about consistent. And I think that box in the back, maybe we can just remind ourselves that it can help us kind of claim that element, that it's not just, hey, what kind of week did we have? And all oh, that's right, the plates are getting passed, let's go ahead. But it gives us a chance to say, yeah, like Paul had encouraged the church, set aside for that first day of the week, that uh, it's a, a consistent thing that's going in the box. And you guys have been evidencing that already. And so, again, it doesn't feel like it's a loss. It's just kind of a redirection of our thinking a little bit. Services have felt rushed to only be an hour. And here's the tension. Uh, I have known for a couple of years that it would probably benefit my preaching and your listening if I were to shorten my sermons a little bit and just struggled to have the personal discipline to do it. And COVID required it. And our heart's desire is we're going to extend the services by 15 minutes, but we do not want to fill that with 15 more minutes of sermon. Uh, I think there'd be something really good to, for most Sundays to be able to keep kind of the length that we're at right now. But we want to add some other things into it. We want to bring the liturgy back in. And so September 20th, we're going to jump back into the Psalms, pick up where we left off and start kind of having liturgy brought back into the service of, of looking at specific scripture and how it relates to the gospel. Uh, we're also going to add another song. Uh, three songs feels way too little. So we're going to at least start out with going back to four songs. We'll do three probably before the sermon and one in response to the sermon. That'll add a little bit more time. But again, I'm, I'm not kidding. Pray for me on this, that I continue to kind of experience some brevity, uh, even as this video might feel like it's dragging on, uh, that I would keep my sermons at a shorter length and not just fill the space. Like, hey, if we get done early, we get done early. And that's okay. But it also, uh, extending the time by 15 minutes gives us more time to do baptisms without feel rushed, hear reports from missionaries, get some testimonies from people, have, have some of those other elements in our service without feeling like they're, they're crowding or pushing other things. And so services are going to go back to 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock, but it'll go from 9 to 10, 15 and 11 to 12, 15 instead of being 90 minutes long. They're going to be 75 minutes long. Uh, that means we're bringing back children's ministry. So children's church is starting back up on the 20th, Lord willing. Um, and we, uh, the, the time in the children's ministry will be a little bit shorter if the sermons are also a little bit shorter. Uh, but they're still going to do what we did. They're going to be there for the songs. We're going to be able to hear bapti see baptisms and hear the testimonies, experience that with the church body. And then during the sermon, uh, they will go ahead and go to their classes. Now, here's the urgent thing. If you have children in children's ministry, really need you to register. In fact, whole church body, this is also to me, I've gotten really lazy with registering. I kind of assume they're going to know I'm here. Well, here's the hard thing. It still makes the numbers difficult for us to know exactly what we're facing. So if we could all get back into the habit of registering, and especially if you have children, if you can register ahead of time, we need you to do that. That allows us to know how many kids are going to be in which classrooms, which allows us to know whether the teacher needs an aid or not, lets us know what rooms we 
might need to move into. It uh, gives us the ability to not have to shift on the fly right there in the middle of the service. Again, the last thing we want to do is like have somebody show up and find out we don't have the capability of, of keeping them in the room or enough teachers or assistants for a certain day. So please register your children um, so that we can be ready for that and, and be fully equipped for that. So um, that's going to be part of it. That's something we've kind of been wanting to do anyway. It helps with security. It helps with safety. It helps with accountability of things to be able to have that. So you're going to be serving us well. And that's probably something we've kind of been wanting to see be more rigid without sounding like we're harsh. It's to say we have this registration system. It does the job. It's good. We need to know that we're using it and really want to encourage you toward that. Now, last thing I want to encourage you toward is life groups. As far as we know, it looks like most of our life groups are rolling out like they have. Uh, some of that's going to be tricky. Some of your life groups are rather large, and it's going to we're going to have to see what happens uh, as certain mandates come out or if size of groups is limited to something. Uh, we're going to figure out exactly what that might look like. For some of your groups, it's not going to be an issue. I know some are looking at meeting outside when they can and some different elements with that. If you're in a life group already and you haven't heard from your leader, please reach out to them and find out what's happening. We are in, without COVID, we'd be in kind of a little bit of different phase. We've got a couple leaders that are needing to step away. We've got some people that have moved. We've got some nights that are shifting. And so there's a lot of kind of building this airplane while it's in the air that's taking place with life groups. And so if it, continues to need some of that flexibility. The Lord's been teaching us that, right? So we're going we're gonna to kind of figure this one out as we go. We're doing a soft launch, which means we're not saying everybody has to start on a certain date. Hopefully you're starting in September. Um, there are questions available for September 20th. So that means the week before the 20th, your group could meet and actually go through life group questions. You can meet before that and just get to know each other, talk about life groups again, catch up on what's gone on over the last six months. Uh, or if you need to meet the week after that or, or another week, uh, there's some flexibility with that as well. But uh, if you're not in a life group yet, you can go online, you can see what the groups are and kind of, you can actually uh, reach out directly to the life group leader from the website and kind of request whether they, they have space and, and get more details about the group. Or uh, you can always contact the office and we'll love to hook you up and, and help you out with that. Um, but that's kind of where we're headed with things. I'm excited about this fall and the timing of us going through the book of Daniel. Um, Dan, we went through Jeremiah a couple of years ago, reminding ourselves that we live the lives of exiles. First Peter calls us the elect exiles, the chosen exiles. This world is not our home. Uh, this place is not our ultimate home. And so um, we're living kind of in a foreign land in that sense. Daniel's going to literally have us walking with brothers and sisters in that experience. And so the book starts off right away with Daniel being exiled, and we watch how they live in faithfulness. We see God's big pattern with the dreams that he provides for Daniel and for Nebuchadnezzar and for others to be able to see what the Lord's accomplishing. And I think we're going to find uh, that it's a very timely word for us as well, uh, and ultimately helps us in the midst of weird seasons, in the midst of difficult things that are going on, in the midst of not knowing the end result of when we're going to be out of the season, uh, to be reminded that God is good, God is at work, God is not surprised, and he is sovereign, and he's good to us. So love you guys. If you have any questions about things, please do not hesitate to contact the office and see how we can help you out. Have a good week.